And we are back for an all new episode of Keep It. I'm Ira Madison III. And I'm noted independent spirit, Louis Fertel. How inspirational mm. am I the way I walk through life? <laughs> I think of myself as a um, dependent spirit. Dependent on spirits? Yeah. Yes. Depend- I become you know, dependent I'm, on I'm, spirits I'm, around you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm literally blind spirit, actually. <laughs> oh, that's nice. A Tony for yeah. Angela Lansbury in your name. Yeah. <laughs> I would be Angela Lansbury in blind spirit. I see that for myself. You, you will enter a turban era soon. I see that for you. <laughs> you know what reminded me of blind spirit oddly this weekend? Did you see the uh, SAG Awards and what Barbara Streisand wore for her lifetime achievement thing? Yes. Excuse me. Do you know what she looked like? A woman who sells you a mysterious lamp at a bazaar. That's what I thought she looked like. <laughs> Scheherazade, and then you know you that take, sort of vibe? Then you take it home and <laughs> what's in this lamp? Right, right. Barbara Eden. Yes. Mm. Uh, well, we have a packed episode this week. Uh, we're doing the intro at the beginning this week. Okay. You know, just, just, just letting people know what's coming up in the episode. All so right. that you can turn it off if you don't care controversial move all right let's go so this week our guest is denai guerrera from the walking dead the ones who live yes a new yeah. sequel series precisely but a black panther legend a unmistakable presence in black panther and to lewis's chagrin and person who gets me talking about nyu that's right uh <laughs> i watch me take to the streets in protest after this episode <laughs> <laughs> actually that was by the way one of my favorite jokes at um the spirit awards from Amy bryant she said something about how people from nyu don't shut up about being from nyu and that is just true i mean as you'll know from this podcast if you listen for even five seconds it's a drinking game at this point uh also this week we are going to get into the harrowing there's really only one way to describe it. Uh, harrowing Wendy Williams documentary on Lifetime, Where is Wendy Williams? And hopefully we'll get into her infamous conversation with Whitney Houston from about 20 some years ago, too, which is a thrilling listen. If you haven't put it on recently, you have to clutch a table while you listen to that interview. It's not comfortable <laughs> for one second. And also this week, Denis Villeneuve talked about how he hates dialogue in films and well, you know, our chatty Kathy Lewis has some things to say about that. So we will also get into that this week. Uh, but before that, we've got a bunch of news that we've sure. got to hit. So first of all, Shea Diaz, they're out. And I don't mean the closet. <laughs> they're out. Also they're out sounds of the like... pet store. <laughs> <laughs> they're out sounds like a Shea Diaz comedy concert. <laughs> Remember when they called that a comedy concert and we just had to pretend that it was a human expression that people say? Well, what's actually funny about that is I have friends who do comedy concerts. If you go see Larry Owens in New York City, that's actually the definition of a comedy concert. There's comedy being done and they're singing. So I guess you would call yeah. it a comedic concert. Yes. Right. I mean, Matt Rogers, comedy concerts. You I, know? Love, I but... love disparagingly calling him a musical comedian. I'm like, oh, my favorite musical comedian. I love when he gets out the banjo. But this also implies that Shea Diaz was also singing songs that we never heard. And boy, do I believe that. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, Shea came out like one of the Animaniacs or all three of them. How many, how many Shea Diaz scenes are just on the cutting room floor? <laughs> Right. Uh, trying out material because the material that made it to air, again, too real for the general population, how hackneyed it was. Things about, oh, I took an Uber it's from my living room to my whatever. Oh, come on. I do find it interesting that Shea Diaz is now out. Of course, there were there were the rumors before that uh, Sarah Ramirez was axed from the series because of their stance on Palestine. And people did point out that. One of the leads of the series, Cynthia Nixon, is, you know, in these streets. She's at the right. marches. She's very vocal. And, She's, and way more vocal than Sarah Ramirez, frankly. 
Yes, of course. And there are other people trying to devil's advocate that online by saying, well, Cynthia Nixon is the lead of the show. So, of course, she could say what she wants. You sound stupid. Yeah, right. (laughs) Basically, Shay Diaz had reached their natural conclusion, which I'm glad that Michael Patrick King realized. But it's still it's still silly to me in how long Shay Diaz lasted. Because when you think of like the original Sex in the City, when Miranda broke up with Shay Diaz, it should have been the last time we saw them. Right, 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 right. No, the arc that Shay Diaz got is longer than most characters would ever get on the original Sex in the City. I mean, this is basically like John Slattery's character getting to be on for three seasons in a row or something, you know? Just getting pissed on <laughs> all over the city. <laughs> with his <laughs> cute little pencil neck. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that would have been a very fun arc to have seen, by the way. Carrie ruining this politician's uh, political career by yes. mentioning that they love water sports. And then, I don't know, him getting revenge. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because it didn't really mix with politics a lot, the original show. Or like New York, New York's version of politics, which of course would make sense if it dovetailed more with Carrie Bradshaw's life. By the way, speaking of that, speaking of that, did you know in the original Sex in the City, Candace Bergen played an editor at Vogue, right? In the final seasons? Yes. Did you know that Candace Bergen's real life daughter it runs Vogue.com now? Oh. So bizarre. I did she not know she that. just did an interview with her own mom talking about the black and white ball from uh feud. Capote versus the Swans because her mom went there and the headline from the article is Candace Bergen doesn't remember if the black or white ball was fun, which is amazing. (laughs) Well, at least the article is fun, you know, because I can't think of anything more vogue than Candace Bergen's daughter working there and running Vogue.com and also doing an interview with her own mother. (laughs) Yeah, right. She does have a bit of access there that, you know, blurs journalistic lines. But you know what? I'm just glad journalism is alive oh, and well please. at Vogue.com. Okay? Oh, yeah. yeah please. Yes, Because yes, everything yes. else is dead. <laughs> no. you. Every week, something gets shuttered, and you're like, I think I knew people who worked there. But then you think, was that 2016, actually? Have they not been there for seven years? You know? And then there's Vice.com, which is shut down, which has actually sent me down a rabbit hole of reading old Vice.com articles. Because let me tell you, if you weren't there... There was a time, the 2010s, when you were re- getting a Vice.com article, uh, pulling one up, that was, that was beautiful. Do you remember like the Vice.com's guide to partying? Right, because it sort of blurred. It was like like it, Rolling Stone's hard journalism mixed with like the mm. village voice, right? Like it wanted to be yes. like on the streets of New York and then also have like a kind of global um, scale. It was all, we do drugs. Uh, everyone's doing cocaine. Here's the parties we're at. It was it was very much a raucous magazine. I'm just using the word raucous. I don't know. <laughs> also, exciting news. I am doing my first live comedy show in New York on Wednesday, March 20th at the Music Hall of Williamsburg. So you can go to ironmadison.com to get tickets. Well, we've had a lot of fun, but now we have to get into the uh, harrowing part of the episode. When we get back, we'll be discussing Wendy Williams, uh, her new documentary on Lifetime, her run in with Whitney Houston and whether or not we're all still standing because of all these things. We'll be right back. Where is Wendy Williams? A Lifetime docuseries about the former talk show host dropped over the weekend. Those of us who were hoping for some tea on Wendy's absence since her show was canceled. Instead, we're faced with a heartbreaking reality of Wendy's cognitive and emotional decline in a documentary that is not only, as we said, harrowing, but also exploitative. Well, there's a lot of questions going on here because, uh, as you said, it's clear she has advanced dementia in certain ways. So, obviously, she can't agree to certain things. And, in fact, during a lot of this movie, she's talking about getting back on television and how her her what she thinks is her plan for getting back on television lo and behold she is on our televisions yeah uh also by the way to point out what wendy williams has a lot of articles have let people know that it is the same cognitive disease that bruce willis has aphasia right so soon she won't be able to recognize faces at all basically but part of the disease that she has it, it was it was also weird just trying to figure out 
whether or not it was a natural decline. What, there was a lot of sort of insinuation that it is alcohol induced as well. Many of her cognitive issues. And let's just talk about that first. The documentary really leans in on Wendy has a drinking problem. Right. Yes. And like uh, she'll be at a restaurant later on with her family and they like she'll like instinctively ask for a drink and then they say to change it to a Coke or something. So it, it comes up again and again. Yeah. And particularly in some of the last parts of the documentary, which is it's four episodes that aired on Saturday and Sunday on Lifetime. Uh, the bottles, party sized bottles being found in her bathroom, being found in her bed. Uh, that was sort of the part that they were leaning into with she's drinking a lot, but First of all, I just want to talk about the fact that a lot of people were saying this documentary feels exploitative. Mm -hmm. What did she consent to? Um, Is Lifetime profiting off of this in sort of an evil way? And I want to say that I felt that way in the first couple of episodes of it. The first two parts, the first two hours. The Sunday night episodes... I don't know if I felt that it was particularly exploitative of her. I actually feel like the last half of the documentary was the part that we really needed to see. Cause, so the, the documentary starts out with they were planning to document her podcast comeback. Right. And then it became very clear that this podcast was never happening. Cool. And I couldn't even tell if it was her manager – and we'll get to him. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, if it was his incompetence or if he really thought that this was how business was supposed to be done in regards to the podcast. Because there's one scene where she's being interviewed about when there's a podcast coming. And they're like, maybe you should shoot a pilot. You know, like let people know like what they're getting. And his response is, you know, you, you don't think that's going to, you know, ruin the sale. You know, if we give them some of the sauce too early, I'm like, what are you talking about? Also, have it's you worked Wendy TV Willi- before? Also, it's Wendy Williams. Like you want. Yes. You should give people a taste of what it's going to be. The thing that they will eventually buy. Yeah. <laughs> we also know what it's going to be about. Yeah. It's Wendy. You know, it's not. I don't think that she was going to do a hard shift into suddenly hosting Red Scare. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a surreal shift from Wendy Williams. But the second half of it was really the part where I think you get into the conservatorship that she was placed under um, legally. Um, the New York courts essentially took power away from her family. Her son, Kevin, used to have power of attorney. And then it was decided that she, he was spending too much of her money. You know, it was in a $80,000 a year apartment, uh, spending about $100,000 a year on Uber Eats. That's how much I spend a month in New York. So I, I was not <laughs> yeah, what deal is he faced getting? by any of that. Yeah, right. <laughs> Must live next door to Sweet Green or something. And then power was given to this random woman. Um, we, we now know that um, her name is Simone Morrissey uh, because she sued Lifetime to try and get the documentary to not be aired. But this brings up – I was watching it with a friend, and they were asking me a lot about the comparisons between this and Britney Spears, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that's immediately what would come to mind for people, or maybe even Amanda Bynes. And the difference here is – Brittany was very specifically a thing where we learned that her father and certain other family members were taking advantage of her. Mm -hmm. And this was harder because the family, for the most part, seems very loving, seems like they're very concerned for her. And I think what it really brought up, they have even an expert come in and talk about um, guardianships and how the courts now are just like not giving them the fam, not putting people under family care anymore. Um, I don't know how you're placed under a conservatorship or guardianship and then seeing the news that we would see about Wendy over the past year. Right. Passing out in the Louis Vuitton store, being just drunk and sort of being on Instagram live being crazy. Right, right, right. No, also the family, at at least to our eyes, is explicitly like, we hope this airs and people understand now what we've gone through. So at least there, and it doesn't feel, and and they're clearly very loving towards her and you see these interactions with her that are, also a bit instructive, I'd hate to say, because we don't have a lot of 
docu series that I've seen about dealing with someone with aphasia with advanced dementia. Because let me be clear, narrative features about this subject are bracing enough. You know, if you put on Still Alice <laughs> or Amore, um, you know, mm. I would say these are very respected movies and also the least rewatched movies in history because they are so tough you know like nobody's like oh it's christmas time put on away from her you know it's like it's hard to look at you know and so watching and this, this which is a real in this in this which documents a real person and we're very familiar with how she was before this all began so we're making the comparison between you know the lickety split compulsively articulate and funny and bitchy uh wendy williams it, it, compared to what she is now this was among the most harrowing things I've seen all year, like of the past year. Um, I will remember watching it and not knowing it was going to, quote unquote, go so hard. Every scene, just her looking at the camera, not looking like the same person she used to be. In a way, um, I think it's like kind of an important doc, but I, not to say it's not exploitative in certain ways, but I just can't think of another thing like it about a celebrity you know yeah i think the thing that really sort of makes it instructive here is the fact that we know we know wendy williams yeah you like you talk about she used to be funny and bitchy uh and really just great with one-liners and of course there was always that bit of her personality that was a little a little bit off or uh, out of bounds absent. and rude be, yeah. out of bounds <laughs> yeah. yes but she'd be talking about something and then also abruptly shift it almost like she had ADD yes uh which she'd be just talking about a topic and then the five different topics would tumble out of her mouth <laughs> within one minute this has turned that into a kind of uncomfortable meanness i think that mm -hmm. there was a lot there were a lot of scenes where what would sort of used to be funny her commenting on how someone's dressed or you know saying something else about someone else uh, in the media her commenting just on anybody who came to the house like the woman doing her nails for instance or an assistant it was just mean and it was just sort of nasty and you could tell that she was didn't even know that she was doing that no it's it, i think that's kind of part of what makes this disease so tough is like it just brings your sort of phobias and your mean predilections to the fore like you can't filter them and so you just become this person who's unable to say anything that isn't um rude in certain cases you know now i do want to say that i'm also grateful for the third part of this series the there's a part where wendy goes to la without telling her manager without telling the family without telling the legal guardian it goes with this publicist that she's had around her sean who is essentially trying to replace the manager and she takes her to la for a meeting with nbc universal we don't get to see the meeting but there is no way that meeting went well no and the moment where wendy is just on the sidewalk looking at her hollywood star Ugh. and then some of the dolls pass by her they're like wendy we love you and I'm sorry, there were actually some funny parts of the documentary, uh, uncomfortably funny parts. She says, I have this meeting with NBC Universal, and I think one of the dolls says, Boots. <laughs> Remember when we say <laughs> that? <laughs> this is this is definitely from a year and a half ago, two years ago. I say but I want to emphasize that I say boots all the time. I'm still part of the problem. <laughs> uh, but she's dressed in this Gucci top, these short shorts. Fishnet stockings, Lara Croft hiking through the Antarctic boots, and talking about how the Wendy show is going to be more sexy like this, and she, you know, not you know, dressed up glam and dresses and things that the Wendy Williams show used to be. She's she's younger and she's sexier now. That she's talking about how she's planning to go to NBC Universal, and I don't know, just seeing this woman driving Wendy around this point where she asks Wendy, "Do you want to go to the Oscars?" And Wendy's like, what? And she's like, the award show. It was horrifying to me. And I feel like, yes, Lifetime might have been. There are parts of this that are exploitative, you could say. But I also feel like at some point, the people making this show, the people who had worked with her on previous documentaries, are watching this unfold and are documenting it because they want people to see what's happening to her. Right, right, right. Also, I was very touched by certain people... Um talking with wendy like black china at the beginning i had oh, a conversation that was with her beautiful. and i was like 
okay, everybody needs a friend like Black China. Uh, <laughs> I did not understand that this woman was so soulful. Uh, it was really lovely watching her lovingly deal with a friend who obviously is not what she once was. And I think it also taps into that Wendy that we sort of didn't know. Uh, the Wendy who she says that Wendy used to make fun of her as Black China, obviously, because she would do her hot topics. But when she went on the show, she had just a sweetness to her. And she said, can I call you Angela? You feel like Angela to me, not Black China when you're sitting in front of me. And then she says that they went out for food afterwards and then would continue to hang out. It reminded me of that veneer just sort of drops when you're in front of some people. I think you remember a few years ago when I went on the Wendy Williams show. Yes. We're doing that Hot Topic panel. And then truly, as soon as the show wraps, uh, I'm just taking a picture, and she sort of grabs my arm, and she was like, that was so much fun. You're coming back. You were great. And this was truly before COVID happened. Uh, so obviously, I never went back. And then the declines yeah. publicly started. But just to see her like all business, and then right after that, still in that moment, just saying it into my ear while we're taking a photo and the crowd is all still there. I'm like, that is the woman that she really was. And I think that also explains why for such a polarizing figure who would say a lot of mean and nasty things about people in the media, there's also still so much love for her. Yeah, right, right, right. Well, also, it's like even though she would be incendiary from time to time, she wouldn't say too too much that was – I mean, I can think of times where I have been literally mad at what she said. But for the most part, you want somebody to be unfiltered about celebrities and the world they live in. You know, it's like it just you're waiting for somebody to say it for you. Um, and which brings us to the topic of her conversation with Whitney Houston from 20 years ago, which we must <laughs> get into. Listening to this back, the thing that that sticks out to me most, Whitney Houston, much as she is digging at Wendy and kind of poking at her and occasionally is angry and is occasionally seemingly unhinged. There's really nothing you can say to unseat Wendy Williams because she sort of owns being trashy or owned being yeah. a mean. So at the end of the day, like Whitney Houston saying things like you just run your mouth. It's like, well, that's exactly what she does. Correct. You know, it's like, it's like <laughs> she has no defenses actually. And that makes it better for her. And there's also a part where, when you could tell Whitney is enjoying sparring with yes, her. Yes. Yes. Because because Whitney Houston is extremely <sighs> witty. Yeah. And there's just a moment where you won't have that anymore. There's just You don't really have celebrities who spar with each other anymore like that. Wendy had it on her show. I mean, there's Omarosa who does it. I guess. With, I mean, let, let us not forget Omarosa with Bethany Frankel on her talk show. Uh, she was like, I worked at the White House. You bake cupcakes. Uh, those moments. But there aren't really people who spar like that anymore. I think it's mostly because we've gotten away from radio. We've gotten away from really interesting talk shows, to be honest. No shade to Kelly Oki. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, think and, of even how the difference uh, between how Howard Stern once was and what he is now. He's obviously still a fabulous radio host, but it's there's not there's not the sense of really digging at a guest on the show or like being I don't want to say mean, but like critical. In a way, this reminds me of the Independent Spirit Awards this weekend. Now, I thought Ad Bryant did an amazing job, but. Mm -hmm. The way in which she said, I feel like being a real award show host right now. I'm going to make fun of the audience. And then she just said, Natalie Portman, you stupid bitch. And then like shied away from like the, the joke was she was supposed to make like a real roast joke about Natalie Portman and just came up uh -huh. with something offensive. But at the same time, I feel like that's the tenor of most celebrities in that position now. Like I'm going to play at being mean, but I'm not being mean at all. In fact, it's pretty safe. You know, whereas Wendy Williams would get up there and say, Natalie Portman, here are my eight problems with you. I ranked them. <laughs> uh, there's a moment early in the documentary where she's flipping through magazines and I don't know, she's, she sees a photo of J-Lo and Ben. It, it, I presume when they got, first got back together and she's like, well, this girl, you know the problem with her? She'll dump him immediately. She dumps all of them. That's her problem. <laughs> and you just miss someone talking about celebrities that way or a radio show where someone would call in or a talk show where, where there would even be some tension to be had. I'd be mean, the last 
tense filled talk show moment that we got. It was last week, and we didn't even get to see the tense moment. I'm, of course, talking about Kelly Rowland on the Today Show. Oh, yes, where she left because the dressing room wasn't big enough. And who did get the big dressing room? J-Lo was there. Of course, yes, In the big one, which is... (laughs) Why is she always at the scene of the crime? Yeah. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Even if she hasn't done anything wrong explicitly... She's always there. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Even if she has not done anything explicitly, it all roads lead back to J-Lo. Yes, right, right, right. But J-Lo was in the dressing room that Kelly wanted because apparently they offered her this broom closet. Uh, and people did chime in to say that the rooms are notoriously very small. Uh Bethany Frankel even chimed in. This is what I mean about the radio sort of vibe. Bethany Frankel is, we now just mostly have celebrities like Bethany or Azalea Banks or Nikki who do their rants online. Yeah, and jump out. In like a live stream. Yeah. But there's no interaction with other people, you know? It's just sort of themselves is what we have now. But Rita Ora is the one who ended up with the room. She came in last minute. And uh, replace Kelly Rowlands on the show, which, you know what? If you stay ready, and Rita Ora stays ready. <laughs> She's at like a starting line. She's like Flojo in position, ready to dart out to Rockefeller Center. <laughs> Someone also did point out, by the way, the difference is Kelly Rowland lives in Los Angeles. And flying in with a mm. team and probably different wardrobe changes is more difficult than... Rita Ora being in New York at the moment and just running over already dressed. And most celebrities who do the Today Show, if you're in New York, you're probably just getting dressed at home. You're not doing other things within a dressing room where you need it. Is she still with Taika? Yeah. Okay. You don't really hear about them anymore. I I, I hate when you – like literally the other weekend I was like, are Dakota Johnson and Chris Martin still together? They are. You just never hear about the two of them. We're just focused on the Madam Web of it all right now. Well, if you follow Rita on Instagram, you see photos of her with Taika. But I will say the fervor of I'm dating Taika Waititi, we're getting married, sort of stopped after the wedding. Right, right. Just like in real life. Now- yes. Good, good luck to them. <laughs> good luck to them. <laughs> I want to talk about another Wendy moment that I don't know if you remember. Do you remember what she called Monica? And the singer Monica, Monica hung up on her. Yes, <laughs> hung up on her because cause she, <laughs> there was a thing I guess Wendy used to do where she would try to call the celebrity but pretend it was somebody else. Oh my god, that is because so if they funny. knew it was Wendy, if they knew it was Wendy calling, they would not take that call. And what did, what did she claim to be like one nine hundred flowers? Like what what excuse I, did she have? I, I forget exactly, but I know there's also Mariah Carey hung up on her once. She would just mix it up with these people. She both also that's the other thing. She clearly did love them, but then also was not enamored of them. That was the difference between mm-hmm. Wendy Williams and most like celebrity interviewees. Yeah, there's there's still this sort of need for a lot of people. I mean, look at us. Please. You know, somebody comes on the show and they're the first thing out of their mouths, that is the best thing anyone has ever <laughs> said about me. Because we spice them up with the intro. Yeah, right. And then we just keep it going. You know, uh, it's rare that someone comes in and it's rare that a celebrity, by the way, even goes on an interview with someone who they know that they have tension with. Right. And yeah, why would they put themselves in that position? You know, and now that there's several channels, now that social media exists, it's just so much easier for celebrities to control their own narrative that way. You don't have to experience the tension of sitting down with Wendy Williams or being on her radio show, et cetera, because you could just peek to the public yourselves now z-way of course is an exception to this rule and she plays with tension and the whole point you would get on the show is tension is the gimmick that said i don't know what form she's going to take in the next couple years we might not have we had z-way do the um george santos thing but i don't know what's happening for her in the future but i would also say that is also very there was more tension in the Instagram live. Yes, right, right, right. Because like, cause, cause there were the comments from the people watching, and there was the sense that this was a little bit more dangerous, you know? The George Santos thing didn't feel dangerous to me at all. No, right, right, right. He arguably even kind of won in a certain way, since, you know, he's among the worst public figures we've ever had, and he came out of it looking, you know, 
like a witty build a bear, which is what he's always dressed like. Which is also when you think about the fact that have we even been talking about George Santos since then? No. I feel that was his last gasp of here's a platform that I'm on and people can see that I'm funny. But even then, he's not important enough to keep going. So the point is, Wendy Williams, what you stood for, what you still stand for to me, important. Honestly, she's an important figure. Yeah. And I just hope that this documentary, if anything comes out of it, someone in the family who actually cares about her gets control over her again. And also... If you got your money at Wells Fargo, pull it out, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's the other message of this. Wells Fargo, well, she kept saying, Wells Fargo got my money. I kept flashing back to undergrad at Loyola. And I was like, you know what? Wells Fargo used to fuck with my money, too. The music man really set up unrealistic expectations about the <laughs> Wells Fargo to me. <laughs> Shirley Jones, I blame the, you. <laughs> the Wells Fargo wagon? Let's talk about it. <laughs> Coming up next, we have Denai Guerrera joining us to talk about her return to the Walking Dead universe in the new spinoff series, The Ones Who Live. And we're also going to talk to her about theater, etc. So we'll be right back. Our guest today is a hero of the modern era. You definitely know them from The Walking Dead, from The Black Panther. But lest we forget, she's also a UN Women Goodwill Ambassador and a Tony-nominated playwright. So truly, she can do it all. She's back on our screens in The Walking Dead, The Ones Who Live. And we are so thrilled to welcome to Keep It, the incomparable Denai Guerrera. Hi. How are you guys? I am fabulous. How are you, Denai? Thank you. That was a very kind introduction. I'm good. I'm good. Doing well. I still think of The Walking Dead as a new show because it is, you know, so state of the art. You would never watch this show and think it belongs anywhere else in time but the present. This show has now been on so long. You were like the Fraser Crane of zombie characters. Uh, <laughs> just generations of you on this show. When you began your journey with this show, did you ever think it would be this long lasting, this epic? I, I had no idea. I had, it's always like, you know, for me with acting, it's always kind of unexpected. Like, oh, where did this come from? Okay, this is great. Um, um, it's just always the sort of thing where you, I could never have thought of this show or this character um, in, if you had asked me before. I, it just came to me and then I was like, oh my God, I really love what these people are doing. I loved the show. I'm scared of horror, so I hadn't watched it. Um, I came in season three and, and caught up because I really was in love with the character on the page. Um, to imagine that it would go that far, I, I, I did not think that way. Because all I was thinking was, can I get through this Georgia heat swinging around this four foot sword and, and stay alive another day? <laughs> That's what was going on in my head day to day. So no, not I many never people get to it. ask themselves that question. Wow, what a rare moment. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, it was. <laughs> and then I have to ask, you know, you exited, you know, the series after Andrew uh, exited as well. Um, but now your characters are reunited on um, The Walking Dead, The Ones Who Live. And what's it like to mm -hmm. to leave, sort of finish playing a character to sort of, you know, put that chapter of your life to rest and then to rejoin again it's a bit different you know from the black panther where um you know you sign up for marvel and especially that project you knew you were going to be doing multiple ones and you would reappear in other aspects but were you prepared to um play uh michonne again yeah i mean the thing that we had done was as as andy exited he said he wanted to complete the narrative in a different form for his character and um, and wanted to, to of course, do that with me. So when he left, that was sort of on the page. And then when I left, it was sort of a contractual thing I was going to come back and do. Mm. We had both left with sort of a, a definitely with a dot, dot, dot uh, to the story, uh, him seeming dead but not being, and my character uh, finding proof that he was still alive and um, seeking to... Um, to, and not being able to, of course, to not to to let that go as mm -hmm. she would, as we know, she is not that type of person. <laughs> she's gonna, she's gonna, she's gonna see a mission through. So, um, especially concerning him. So she definitely um, was always. It was always a plan to complete their narrative. 
we the the, the form it took and the time it took was a whole other story <laughs> but the um but the plan to, for their for to com- accomplish what we we looked at is accomplish what you proposed you propose that these characters um have this like you know epic love and they are you know, she's finding he's still alive. We know he's still alive. So we knew we knew ultimately we had to come and complete the narrative in some form. But stepping away for, you know, are the different reasons we did um, from the mothership. Um, we, we knew ultimately, though, the characters would be the, the wig and the sword would be returned to <laughs> at some point. Now, you said when you started the show, you didn't watch horror. Did you uh, over time become more interested in the genre or have you stayed away from it, generally speaking, unless, of course, you're, you know, wielding a sword? Yeah, no, I, I still have have no interest in it. I I, do, <laughs> I, I really don't. I find it. I, I have a very active imagination, especially at night. So, and I like to. I like sleep. Like I don't want to wake up and start thinking about. Okay, let me go check. Let me just go check that door's lock one more time. You know what I mean? Like I just want. Like I get very hyperactive in the imagination. So I don't like horror, uh, still. But I I don't mind being a part of it it's very strange i was just at the saturn awards a couple weeks ago and it was just full of uh, people from all these genres and it's it's quite a cool bunch of folk but i still can't i can hang with them on that realm but just not on the screen i did grow to love the work that you know greg nicotero's is fantastic uh um you know special makeup artist uh, for our show who created all that that amazing gore and i did grow to love the the artistry behind what he did and the gore itself and how much how many times one has to be covered in it um dead or alive on that show uh so you know i grew to love the artistry behind the horror and that made me sort of um be tamed like it, it was tamed in terms of my experience of it um on the screen for for that one show but everything else no i'm still i'm still not into it I'm not into horror <laughs> uh well one thing i want to ask you about um crafting characters is exciting that you know we know that you are this amazing actress but you are also a really fucking good playwright uh, and uh i've had the pleasure of seeing some of your work um and i've also had the pleasure of seeing you in um joe turner's come and gone um with oh my god really Yes. Oh my God. Yeah, yes, I saw that production. Um, and I believe that was your Broadway debut. Yes. And that's yes. one of my favorite yes. plays um, um, by August Wilson. Oh, wow. And I want to I ask you about being a playwright, I guess, you know, and um, what it's like, um, yeah. you know, what interests you about that particular part of um, the craft and crafting your own um, characters and then sort of what freedom you feel um, then stepping into other things and not having to worry about any of that. Well, you know, actually, I, I really, that's so funny you saw that play. It was so long ago. That's amazing. <laughs> um, and I just saw, I saw Anjanu recently and we were just reminiscing about it. Um, she's also from my grad school. So we, mm-hmm. there were, we're a little, um, little bit of a little family. Um, so it was just so great to catch up with her and really excited for all that's happened with her. Um, but yeah, it was, um, I do, it's funny you mentioned August Wilson because as a playwright, there are times I, I turn to him for when I have writer's block <laughs> because mm-hmm. there's something so unapologetic about his voice, <clears throat> not because I'm trying to imitate him, of course, never would, who could, but it's more about the fact that he has such a clear, unapologetic voice from the world that he's illuminating. And sometimes one needs a reminder and, uh, of their own unapologetic voice. And I've always found him to be such a powerful uh, manifestation of that for for myself as a black writer. Um, but yeah, the reason why I started to write was because I just simply could not find any narratives that told the stories I wanted to tell. It was really necessity being the mother of invention. I just was like, I can't find um, stories. I grew up, I was I was born in the Midwest that I, um, my parents were here for university and then my, par- my father was a professor here. Mm-hmm. And then I moved to Zimbabwe when I was five, six years old. So I grew up there, came back here for college 
and have been here ever since largely and was largely like um where are the stories around you know and i'm studying this craft i couldn't find the stories around african women or just that are multi-dimensional that didn't put us as in very objectified roles and and i found that really problematic and unacceptable so i just had to start doing it myself and um but then I found great joy in that because the, the joy often is when you see people that you, you know, that often don't get lead roles, get a lead role. This one actress, Pascal Armand, who's a Tony nominee from my play Eclipsed, she um, was also in a play of mine called The Convert. She was the lead in that. And, um, you know, she that she'd been acting and really a very respected uh, theater actress in New York for many years. But she hadn't had a lead role till, you know, till I... Gave, till she got the role in the convert, and that's often what happens with black women, you know, is that they don't get to helm a narrative very often, and what that's kind of what's given me the most pleasure and the most joy is to see black women get to stand in the center of a narrative, and um and be that protagonist, be that character you 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 take the journey with, and uh, not be on the side, not be supporting, not you know, but be the helmer, and we're so obviously capable of that. But it's surprising how rarely it happens. And Pascal was just such an example of that uh, type of issue. So that's actually where I find the most joy and where I keep feeling the need to continue to create is there's so many stories that I feel haven't been told and don't get told. And um, and there's so, when they land in my head, I, I, I have to pursue them because um, I feel it'll bless many uh, and many black women like me. Lupina Nyong'o also nominated for a Tony for Eclipsed, we should mention. And I wanted to mm -hmm. say you brought we brought up uh, Anjanou Ellis Taylor, who was just in this movie, Origin, which Ira and I discussed uh, on the podcast. We were talking about just how awesome it is to see somebody, a, a lead character whose whole thing is, although there's an emotional component to the story, it's really just about somebody who's intellectually curious. And mm, I was mm, wondering, mm. what roles have you just seen wherever, in plays, movies, whatever, that you think, oh, thank God, that's out there. Thank. Are there any uh, roles, performances you've seen recently that speak to this need you have to like uh, roles that are cool that you would that you yourself would have liked to have written, perhaps? Oh wow. Um. Um. Yes, that's such a brilliant example. And of course, the astounding um, filmmaker Ava DuVernay is so brilliant at that as well. Um. And you know, she's just been navigating that terrain to perfection. Um. Oh God! You put me on the spot with that. Ah, <laughs> well, you've had to create so many characters. I, you know, I'm sure it's rare that you know, uh, you know, enough come around for you to just watch. Yes, yes. Um, I'm just trying to think of what I've watched recently. I've been, I've been in a bit of a hibernating writing mode. Um, <laughs> you know, I was thinking, what is the Black Griselda? That's what was going through my mind recently. <laughs> you know, but um, you know, that's just. That was a random thought. Fair question. Yeah. <laughs> <I laughs> now I'm wondering. I know. I know she exists. I'm, I'm, now I've got to go find her. Um, uh, hopefully, you know, her story's already, you know, she, hopefully I'm, I will be outing her, but uh, in terms of her, her, if she has a, an active operation. But I was just like, like what, <laughs> you know, who is that person in, in the black realm? Um, but yeah, I think uh, definitely stories like, you know, stories that allow black women to just be all things i thought you know i think of course you think of things that viola's done that's a beautiful mm. example you know even with her show um um how to get away with murder and then you know even recently with woman king you know that's that's when we're starting to crack into new into new ex examples of how yeah yeah show us in all of our all of it, all of our complexity. Let it be out there and let it be unapologetic and let us navigate and helm the damn story. I have to ask them too, you know, you have had um, the gift, the joy of being able to play, you know, two strong um, female characters like Okoye um, is one of them. And um, these feel, I guess, sort of like, um, it's interesting when Black Panther came out uh, and even when your character debuted in Walking Dead, I feel like you spearheaded two characters who were unlike black women we'd seen on TV before um, and sort of, I think, ushered in this new um, genre of just being able to see black women play characters like this. I think of the Woman King as something that is probably um, beneficial mm -hmm. to Black Panther and also um, your character in Walking Dead being created. Are you seeing more... Uh, 
just fulfilling characters in television and film that you're being offered um, on more for um, other women that you work with and consider peers and friends um, to be able to um, get those roles as well coming to them. Thank you. Yeah, I think definitely um, there are these exa- more and more examples that come out, the more and more it becomes like, obviously, this should be done and it should be done more and more. And you're seeing it. You are you definitely are seeing more of things like this where, you know, the story is being told from a black perspective and, and even often from a female perspective. We're starting to see that a little bit more and more. It's inching. It's inching. But at the same time, you know, in my um, my native tongue, my parents language, Shauna, um, which I wish I spoke better. There's a word that means uh, just as a word that's a, it's a panebasa, which means there is work to be done, and that's why that's why I feel when I hear you ask that question, I just think I just think panebasa. You know, like there's still <laughs> a lot of ground to cover. There are a lot of things that um, you know are still hard to get done and out there, and um, and there's still you know that that aspect of saying yes, we have. Let the story be complex. Let it be complicated. Don't try to simplify it to a, a generalized ideal of blackness. You know, that's I think that's where we're still um, we're still pushing. And uh, and you know, so pane basa. But there has there has been work done, and I'm I'm thankful to have been in any way, shape, or form a part of that work. Um, uh, but you know, we have a lot of work to do, definitely. Also, so last year. You got to play Richard the Third in Shakespeare in the Park. It was uh, so fucking good. Was this ever? I'm, so you saw that? Okay. Yeah, Shakespeare um, in the Park. I can't believe I didn't get to see it. I'm. Uh, does that? I mean, like, that's the perhaps the epic stage role of all time. Is that an experience that lingers on you? Is it something you ever expected to do? No, it's nothing I ever expected to do. And I will say, when I when Oscar used just called me and said it, I just cracked up laughing. <laughs> I just laughed because he's been trying to get me back on stage for a long time. And I was like, oh, now he got me. Because this was, I was like, this is going to be a hard one to say no. How do you say no to that, right? But at the same time, I just couldn't say yes because I was like, this is, that is absolutely terrifying. Um, and I was terrified and I just, I didn't give them an answer for months, him and Robert. And then I finally was like, you know, I just thought, man, I don't know. I think it was Sidney Poitier had recently passed, and there was some. It was an interview I saw him say. He said something to Oprah that I said, "Girl, get off your butt and go do that darn role." Like you know what I mean? This, <laughs> think about what this man navigated at the time that he did. You know, get off your butt and go do that thing. And it's the hardest thing I've ever done. Hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Do I miss the guy? I miss the guy. I do miss the guy. You know, he was. He's a. He's terrible. He's a terrible human being. But you understand a lot. I understood him at the same time, which I don't know what that means. So you know, but I just, I really did. Um, I had a really. It was very diff. It was hard as heck, and it was. It was very rewarding, and I, I, I remember him fondly. <laughs> that makes any sense. Well, also, I mean, it must be a relief to know it probably cannot get any harder than that. I mean, truly, what else is there out there unless you like performed like the entire Oristea like right in a row or something? You know? <laughs> yeah, it was it was extremely hard and it was so hot. And I remember I was arguing. I had to argue down my wonderful um, costume designer, uh, Dede. I had to argue with her because she wanted to put me in leather pants. I was like, girl, I will fly it <laughs> right off. Uh, right down the river, okay? Like, I'm <laughs> running up and down this thing for, for two and a half, three hours. Like, I can't do that. She, I mean, the look would have been cool, but I was like, uh-uh, it's not happening. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's just all types of things that go into it. Like, they they were recording it for PBS Greater Performances, and, and my director, Robert O'Hara, whose idea this was, he was like, he also directed my first play ever, so we're old friends. And and he was like, you know, we got to do something about how much Denai's sweating by the end of the first scene because <laughs> she ain't gonna like how this looks on camera on television. So yeah, it was it was it was work. I mean, I think I I don't know how many pounds I dropped just doing that role. Um, but at the same time, I'm, I I always wanted to do the hardest thing, the action thing, and a- he was like action plus all the language you could ever want and. <laughs> I do love I do love Shakespeare and I I've, I've always you know had a affinity for it to some extent and so uh, I've done Shakespeare in the Park before and loved that performance uh, mm. I mean love that experience though she's the opposite she was a nun a, mm. a virtuous nun Isabella so I think mm. I've done the whole gamut in two roles but yeah I don't know I, I just I I love the people I met there one of the amazing actors I met um, 
um, Matt Jeffers, who you will meet on the show, um, The Ones Who Live, because mm. I just, I was working with him and I was like, oh no, this, he's got to, he's got to come, he's got to come on into the, into The Walking Dead. I mean, what the heck? <laughs> and, um, and I just told my two co-creators, Andy and Gimple, I said, I have, we have the Nat. The Nat is a character my character gets very close to in the show. Uh, she looks for Rick. And I was like, I think I found him and, and Gimple came and saw the show and, and agreed. So, you know, it was, I made some really good, uh, there's some beautiful, wonderful people I got to know and, and I'm um, very thankful for that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, b b before Lewis asked, like I was even going to ask, you know, like what about theater um, interests you the most? Cause you know, I think like someone who's interested in Shakespeare, yes, particularly if you're um, an actress, you know, like the, the roles you get, like you said, you played Isabella in Measure for Measure. That is sort of what you expect mm -hmm. to get. And I'm like, you can't really ask, like, well, what are you getting out of Shakespeare anymore once you, you know, get to play Richard III? Uh, that's um, mm -hmm. something fun that you get to do. But mm -hmm. what do you love about theater the most that aren't your works? You know, um, any playwrights that you're really enjoying? Um, any sort of stories that you enjoy watching? that are not um, the stories that you want to mm -hmm. tell, um, but stories that you just be, enjoy where you're like, it is nice to sit in a theater with people and enjoy this story communally for a couple hours. Oh yeah, there's so many great playwrights. I just um, just was just celebrating mm -hmm. my dear sister, uh, Jocelyn Beal. She her oh. was just recently on Broadway, Judges. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, I love uh, that play. She's a dear friend of mine. Yeah, yeah. And we were, you know, she's, she's a, you know, someone I'm, you know, working, developing works with, and someone mm -hmm. I really adore. And so to see her work sort of fly like that, and, and, you know, they were, that's sort of a story that really gets me, because there were women who are immigrant um, hairdressers coming down from Harlem, mm -hmm. and going into the theater and, and, and seeing themselves in this great white way, <laughs> as it's literally called. <laughs> And, and really being able to celebrate themselves and, and a reflection of the narratives and the stories that they carry. And that to me is, is so powerful. And then of course, going out to such a massive audience at the same time as it did. So I'm really, I was really thrilled by her, uh, by this, that accomplishment for her. And, you know, I, I recently watched Fat Ham as well, which I thought was fantastic. Mm. Um, I watched that while we were shooting um, The Ones Who Live. That was kind of our reprieve was to catch some theater here and there from shooting outside in freezing Jersey. Um, <laughs> so that was another fantastic piece of work. And another, and it did that thing that I love, which is it played on a classic, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it took a classic and, and made it its own, which, you know, I, I love that because I grew up, you know, in a very neo-colonial educational system in, in post-colonial Zimbabwe. And, you know, so if, they, if you're going to like sh shove all this Western, you know, uh, you know, content down my throat, you know, I'm going to make it my own and figure out my way in. And it might be, uh, it might seem quite irreverent and, and, and so <laughs> be it. And thank God if it does, you know, because it should. And so I love, I love that type of, uh, of, of way of getting at it. Um, there's so many, there's so many great, um, Playwrights right now, I don't think I'm going to blank on it all, but it is, there are some, you know, of course, as I mentioned, you know, the, the stalwart of all, of all, in a lot, lot of ways, of course, and I love Lynn Nottage. Lynn Nottage is like a mentor of mine mm -hmm. um, and uh, has said words to me that have caused me to just, she doesn't even know what a one little sentence she said did for me. You know what I mean? She's just <laughs> one of those. And with such an astounding, generous heart and spirit and brilliance at the same time. So everything she writes, it's like, you know, you're just in a master class. Um, and I just, I adore her. I definitely recommend I um, Dominique Morisot's new play, mm -hmm. Sunset Baby. It just opened Oh, I up. love Dominique. Uh, yeah, yes. so I saw that. Oh, yes, weekend. it just opened. Yes. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yes, yes. I love Dominique. I've been trying to get her to go to Zimbabwe because <laughs> I have a nonprofit <laughs> there where I take Americans to teach. And uh, we're just figuring out the right time for it. But yeah, she's um, she's incredible, and I think she would be amazing. In now, of course, uh, before we let you go, Black Panther is of course not live theater, but the way those movies are structured, <laughs> everybody gets such incredible acting moments that I feel like mm -hmm. on set you must just get to be face to face with people, you know, giving their all, giving like Broadway size 
performances for the screen. You are, of course, incredibly arresting in these films. Do you have any favorite on-set moments watching other people act? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I came and watched a scene um, where Letitia is basically telling um, Baku um, that he is going to fight in her war. (laughs) And I just, I mean, I loved, I was just, I was just floored. It was just so brilliant. And, um, you know, the, 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 the story, you know, we do a lot of shaping of those scenes there in front of the camera on the day. You know, mm-hmm. so you don't. I didn't know what was about to come out of her as she was being shot. You know, you didn't know what was going to come out, and what she came through with and how she nailed that um, was so powerful. There were a couple moments that Winston, he te- you don't see it on screen, but he teared up because it was like, damn, like to see this power coming out of this this young woman, and in a way that is very, it's full of vengeance, it's full of war, it's full of a sense of destroying. I want to destroy that man in that, in that other place. You know what I mean? So he was so moved by just being in her presence. And I watched that and was just like, God dang, I just love this place. I love what I do for a living to just watch those things come to life, you know, was really, really powerful. That's one that jumps to my mind immediately. I I remember the scene so specifically too. So I'm like watching it as you're describing it. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It was fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. Oh my God, you're such a fabulous interviewee too. Yeah, I, I go on and on. I will say, I hope I, I hope I answer a, 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 any question directly because I tend to, you know, go on and on. So I hope. No, of course you. Would, everything that you said was l- wonderful, and I mean, also great to hear those um, stories from you. So thank you for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. It's been really fun. Appreciate it, guys. Really enjoy your, your work, by the way, both of you. Oh, how nice. Oh, thank you. Go listen to some people who are smarter. I'm sorry. I have to discourage you. Sorry. Don't. I mean, yeah, yeah, you're smart. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm always happy to talk to another Tish grad, too. So, um, oh, really? I love that. Oh, yeah. wonderful. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. I did the dramatic Wait, writing like, uh, program, MFA, um, oh, and I graduated 2011. Yeah. Oh, very, very cool. Very, very cool. Okay. I'm looking yeah. out for you. I'm looking out for you. Come on, Ira. You got the purple on. I see that. Yeah. <laughs> I see it now. <laughs> So over the weekend, Denis Villeneuve, uh, director of many of our favorite movies of the past few years, including Arrival, Sicario, Blade Runner 2049, where I believe Jared Leto just showed up and they filmed an entire movie around him being weird. They're like, you want to dress in gold? Great. Stick around. Uh, He said this, frankly, I hate dialogue. Dialogue is for theater and television. I don't remember movies because of a good line. I remember movies because of a strong image. I'm not interested in dialogue at all. Pure image and sound. That is the power of cinema. But it is something not obvious when you watch movies today. Movies have been corrupted by television. Okay, first of all, bitch, don't you ever put television and theater in the same (laughs) breath again. (laughs) <laughs> television is for entertainment theater is art movies are art theater and movies go together i have to say i actually am sort of grateful to hear this perspective because it's clarifying like when you see people come out of the criterion closet and they're talking about like um old auteuristic movies i feel like they're routinely talking about images more than they're ever talking about characters and dialogue and stuff and it's just a school of thought that i believe exists you know that movies are about image and sound and feeling enveloped it is just not really why i go to the movies i am Mm. truly dialogue oriented i am way more mike nichols oriented than stanley kubrick oriented and um i don't know do do you concur with this perspective at all what do you think of this it's very interesting because i feel like as a person who has written for television uh as a person who grew up on american films the way that we did especially queer coded films. It's all about di- snappy dialogue. It's all about people yeah. interacting. And I love theater as well, obviously. But as I've been dipping into film more, obviously within college when I was watching certain films or trying to uh, educate myself on certain foreign films more, there is something to be said about the fact that non-american films do rely on images a lot more and i will say that when i'm thinking about film 
it is a lot of the striking images that do hit me first before the dialogue. The dialogue is good, but when I think about my favorite directors, like um, Almodovar, for instance, mm-hmm. it's it's all about those bright colors, the images, the costumes, you know, the the staging, and I mean, just speaking of another Denis, Claire Denis, uh, uh-huh. a French director, that is all about. The image. I mean, Beau Travel like barely has any dialogue in it. And right, right, right. Stars at noon. The dialogue is from Margaret Qualley and Joe Alwyn, and so you'd rather not listen to it anyway. <laughs> I have the feeling Margaret Qualley is going to win an Oscar in the next like six or seven years. So bite for your drive time. away dolls, this, uh, maybe not. I hear Benny <laughs> Feldstein's good in that. I haven't seen it yet, but. Um, uh, it's just literally all of my favorite movies. It's about the dialogue, ultimately. Like, All About Eve doesn't exist without the dialogue. Even uh, Rear Window, a suspenseful movie, which has plenty of spectacle in it, lots to look at, is about character dynamics before it is about being terrified, I think. I wonder if you're like a film scholar and a filmmaker, if sound and spectacle, if those are the kind of things you're more impressed with yourself for achieving. Whereas I don't know that there are many people who pride themselves most on capturing, I don't know, a conversation or just somebody talking in a fascinating way, even though that's what I like most about movies. You know, I'm still recovering from Woody Allen sucking. I That's like that's the <laughs> mode of film I prefer, you know. <laughs> I think there's also something to be said, though, about people who do both writing and directing. Yeah. You would never say that a Tarantino film is not about the images in it. But right. you also would never say his films aren't about the dialogue. Right. He is definitely equally obsessed with both. Like he loves the snappiness as he is clearly a snappy person. In fact, he looks like mm-hmm. he's going to snap most time you <laughs> most times you see him. But he's then a also yeah, but also he's obsessed with old movies and uh mm-hmm. uh tributing things and then making things splashier than they ever were before. You yeah, know what I like I about mean, Tarantino? Refuses to be bored. That's something I do appreciate about him. <laughs> except for the hateful eight. So there's <laughs> yeah, also the world's longest movie, yes. Yeah. Um I, I also did a disservice to Al Motivar even there because his dialogue is also snappy and it's funny. Oh, and yeah. that comes from the tradition of melodramas and telenovelas. And I just think that you brought up all about Eve. And that comes specifically, though, from a period where there was more of a blur between radio dramas, theater, and film. People were writing right. dialogue. And there they were obviously beautiful, gorgeous images in probably more gorgeous images in Hitchcock than I would say in All About Eve. I actually don't really remember much of the visuals in All About Eve, to be honest. Um, I mean, I remember mo- scenes and moments, but, you know, like visually yeah. stunning. I don't know how visually stunning it is uh, to me, but that's also just coming from when films were black and white as well. Right. You know, you're not taking in all of those images. It's before Technicolor, so it is about the dialogue it felt more theater based and i feel like as america started moving towards technicolor there was color and images and there's also dialogue but then you had a whole school of people like godard uh or even i don't know how much dialogue is really in most the bergman films are about the images Mm -hmm. a lot of times too but they're also about a conversation too so i don't know it is It is an interesting question that I feel like a lot of people were having fun with online. Some people were like, well, Well, you know what? That's true. But then also, there are people who just prefer movies that have dialogue in them. And there are some people who really just only want that visual spectacle. I think also, there's just a difference in how people learn like some people Mm -hmm. i would consider myself more auditory so the way people speak is going to resonate with me more whereas if you are entirely visual i don't know maybe conversations fall on deaf ears though i have to say it feels crazy to me to say you don't like dialogue but maybe it's with the here i am getting into just pop psychology (laughs) the love languages thing how some people are words of affirmation and then some Mm. people aren't that they're something totally different all i am is words of affirmation please write a poem about me that's what i want (laughs) <laughs> but some people, I guess, don't respond to that. I think words are just filling the air and not taking taking this dynamic anywhere. I mean, what's the last time um, he did dialogue anyway? Was it that talking fish in Maelstrom? <laughs> the, I would say I, Arrival has some good um, 
dialogue scenes. Uh, you would not True. hire Amy Adams if you weren't didn't care about dialogue. But that also brings to mind another question. But that's all if about you the don't board, like... too. You know, it's all about the visualness of the aliens. Uh, oh, so sure. No, no, no. It's an unmistakably awesome looking movie. I do not mean to take that away from Arrival. But if you don't like dialogue, does that mean you kind of don't like actors? Like that you think <laughs> they could kind of be anybody? Like in the Hitchcock way where you're like, well, they're cattle to me. I honestly kind of feel that way about him yeah to be honest when you think about dune uh when you think about the way he talks about film i think it's all uh, maybe a little bit sort of incidental to him the actors case in point i just saw tenet again uh yesterday it was rescreening for a week in imax because the whole narrative around tenant was people didn't really get to enjoy it while they were watching it at home um during COVID, and now right. you can really see it on the big screen and unfortunately that bitch was correct because now <laughs> i do love tenant so much uh but when you hear there was a conversation that nolan um had with denis um after a screening at IMAX and I watched it on YouTube and just their conversations where he was, where Chris Nolan was talking about working with the actors uh, versus where Denis Villeneuve was talking about working with the film. There was definitely an emphasis on the spectacle for him as opposed to working with actors. Like he talked about, he storyboarded the film and uh, writes the script and then based off of the new storyboard for it, rewrites the script. So it's really about getting these visual images mm -hmm. working, you know? And Nolan talked about how you, the scene where John David Washington's fighting himself, right? They did that mm -hmm. one first. They sh did not use any reverse camera work on that. So what happened is John David Washington learned that fight two different ways. He learned it the regular way and then he learned it the inverse way if you know tenant like it's about the inverse time going backwards right when you're you know i get the movie now but it took me a minute uh i was very stoned the first time i watched it um but he learned that two different ways and it was about him working with the actors and i don't know i think from him doing oppenheimer as well and that <laughs> very um serial killer note that he left on killian murphy's script it was uh finally a lead for you now you know which was I, <laughs> <laughs> that seems like something a, a mean gay director would do yeah. like truman capote leaves that to one of the swans or something <laughs> but even that the he is a person who likes dialogue because there's so many quiet moments in oppenheimer that are just people oh, yeah. speaking you know and it's i think that he is a well-rounded director where he loves the dialogue and he also loves the visual spectacle of a movie but yeah i mean that's that's a that's a harder one to really sort of parse because obviously i love dialogue and there's certain films i love with dialogue but there's also some films where i just really love letting the images wash over me and i do think at the end of the day film is more about the visuals than the dialogue i mean i think it's hard to be empirical about it but i think oppenheimer is a good example of like the middle of the movie when it's about the bomb and the the suspense waiting for that moment to happen you know the world ending sort of mushroom clouding uh oppenheimer's vision coming to be and then the last half of the or the last act of the movie the everybody sort of testifying that's when the movie to me becomes like a play like it's a you know it's compelling in the way something like 12 angry men might be or you know uh something from the 50s where it's on stage and everybody gets a turn to talk and we're just you know the as the audience we're being clued into all these different perspectives and, you know, finally hearing from Emily Blunt and uh, finally hearing the true intentions of Robert Downey Jr. You know, these these reveals that all come through conversations. And I think that's ultimately why I like I, I prefer dialogue in movies over spectacle is because it oh, just it reveals something about the character itself, which I find to be mm -hmm. the most exciting part of a movie. You know, like, ah, now I'm learning what that person really is. That's fair. But I would also say that a lot of the colors or a lot of costumes sort of reveal who people are too so i don't know i think there's just a different school of thought of people who 
love one or the other. And I think more often than not, a French director just isn't going to give a fuck about the dialogue. True. I do have to say the Frenchness is coming into play here, I think. Um, and also, you know, if you don't like dialogue that much, I think maybe therapy is for you. I don't know. I feel like maybe you could tap into something here that will help you ultimately in your journey to be a person. Actually, this may stem from the fact that there's a TV show that I still don't know if it's happening. And maybe uh, he decided that he didn't want to do it anymore. But Villeneuve was supposed to be directing an HBO series that was announced in 2020, produced by Jake Gyllenhaal, being written by Jonathan Nolan, Christopher Nolan's brother. This was announced in 2020, but haven't heard anything about it since. So maybe he tried his hand at television and said, fuck this. Mm. I would actually love it if that were the case. Because, I, you know, when I watch something like the SAG Awards and the TV actors are just mingling with the movie actors, I get uncomfortable. I mean, I truly think they should have different <laughs> catering. I'm sorry. The, Sandra Huller has to be around, like, Modern Family alums. Does that sound right to you? I don't think so. Well, you know Sandra Huller's going to be on Only Murders in the Building, probably, at this oh, point. God. I'm going to leave the studio. I need, to not, I need to not be here. I guess if Meryl's there, it makes it okay. By the way, Meryl and Martin Short... Should we talk about that? I'm sorry. So they lied to us. They're clearly dating or something. Mm. Well, I feel like that's beautiful for them. It sure is. It's arguably the most beautiful thing I've seen. <laughs> Let us in on it. We're watching it. I You're need beloved. to catch up on only murders and then maybe I'll be more invested in that relationship. Oh, okay. But I mean, it's just like her... Um, her slyness, by the way, at the SAG Awards this weekend, she did like a physical bit where she pretended to bump into the mic and she said she forgot her glasses. Girl, that was some Comedia Del Art shit. I believed that. <laughs> All the setup for she the Double Wears Prada reunion. Right. Yes. And they came in with like her glasses and her bag. That yeah. was fucking awesome. She really did go to <laughs> Yale. <laughs> uh, you've got me thinking now about the divide between film and TV. Who are people who have not done TV yet? Who are truly Kate like Blanche? I am... No, she did Mrs. America limited series. Does that count? I guess it does. Yeah, because she also did Mildred Pierce. No, no, that was no, Kate that was Winslet. Winslet. Yeah. The Kates, right? They're the, they're, honestly, that's the same bitch. Okay, <laughs> you cannot. That is some Hannah Montana shit going on. I'm sorry. <laughs> and they both started in Woody Allen movies way too late. Yes, yes. I can't say. Oh well, Robert Downey Jr. did Allie Daniel Day Lewis. Yeah. yeah, Daniel Day Lewis. Well, he's not doing anything, right? No, he's like I assume painting or something. It's a great. I walking around New York uh, in uh, Gen Z outfits is what right. he's doing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Probably looking amazing at sixty seven or whatever. But I think that he may be one of the last holdouts of people who just have not done television. I mean, Meryl's done it now. Julia Roberts has done it. Right. No, it's upsetting. I, I believe Denzel in these bifurcations. TV? This is where oh, I believe Denzel's... in a binary. This right here. Yes. Yeah. Denzel good started and in TV. Not as good. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Denzel is a pretty good answer, though. Yeah. Yeah. But because I feel like maybe Denzel and Clooney, I feel like these are people who started in television and then since the transition to movies have not gone back. Right, right, right. No, oh. I can't imagine. Tom. Of course, Tom Cruise. Yes, yeah. which is crazy because you would think he would. I mean, we have movie. There's like a Jack Reacher TV show and stuff. There's plenty of things he would be a fit for on television, especially in this age of spending tons and tons of money on a streaming series. But yeah, well, I feel like the Mission Impossible movies are basically a 27 season running TV show at this point. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. When we are back, keep it. And we're back with our favorite segment of the episode, and I would be remiss to say that we, our producer told us during the break, Leonardo DiCaprio, since uh, yes. Growing Pains has not been back on television, he's produced a lot of things, but... He's like, keep me off the small screen. He's like, don't watch me on your phone, bitch. <laughs> he, he and Marty are like fist bumping on that. <laughs> Marty, though, has done TV. Girl, he threw vinyl at us, and I'm still injured. And remember Boardwalk Empire? Right, which might still be on. There's no telling, and it's rude ne to ask. Never has there more been a show where people were continuously telling you about its importance while it was on the air, and now since it's gone off the air, I haven't heard a single person talk about Boardwalk Empire. 
And by the way, where is Paz de la Huerta? Uh, the honest question, and I believe we should be concerned for our safety. <laughs> what is your keep it this week? Oh, right. The show. Uh, yeah. My keep it is uh, involving a album I'm listening to obsessively again. I bought it when it came out. It's now 20 years old. I said I didn't mind the I said I didn't really care for Confessions having a 20th anniversary um, mm -hmm. uh, renaissance and the Internet was upset. You know what? Good. Good for them. They should have spoken up. I'm glad <laughs> you tweeted but I'm talking that. About, yeah, <laughs> I did not know. I said it on the podcast here Oh. Um, after Usher Super Bowl. But I have been listening to Gwen Stefani's Love Angel Music Baby and all things considered a pretty perfect pop album, except mm -hmm. for what I'm going to say my keep it to keep it to long way to go with Andre 3000, <laughs> the final track on the album. I, don't, I can't think of another album like this. Maybe Future Nostalgia by Dua Lipa, where up until the last track, it is flawless. It is a, it is an artistic vision that is very narrowed in. It's, you know, Gwen Stefani had this very candy coated designer aesthetic that was both winking and mm -hmm. gleefully legitimately stupid. She went for it. And the pop hooks were popping. I mean, like uh, what you waiting for is produced by Nelly Hooper, who did. Uh, all of Bjork singles from the early 90s, like mm -hmm. Human Behavior and It's Oh So Quiet and did uh, Bedtime Story by Madonna. Uh, you had Cool, which has a wonderful video. You had Holla Back Girl, which is, of course, one of the great uh, radio songs of all time. And a a fun rejoinder to Courtney Love, allegedly, who wouldn't stop making fun of uh, Gwen Stefani at one point. But you get through the album and there are so many lo lovely songs. The Real Thing is a great uh, non-single. Mm. Serious is a great non-single. Then she makes an attempt at racial healing, which I'm just going to say she is not capable of achieving on Long Way to Go with Andre 3000, where she says, when snow hits the asphalt, cold looks and bad talk come. Mm -hmm. Is it supposed to be written like something from the Harlem Renaissance? Because she, I don't <laughs> feel, is familiar with the works of Langston Hughes. I don't know what she was going for with those lyrics. <laughs> cold looks and bad talk come. First of all, that is a direct lift from County Cullen. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I uh, clearly I'm unfamiliar. It's been, okay. I haven't been to college in a couple of years. <laughs> Her like that we jazz song, June Gwendolyn Brooks writing. Come on. That song. Going back 20 years when this album first came out, when I first got my little hands on LAMB. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. Nice. Nice. I remember getting to that song and recoiling yeah. to, and going, what the fuck? And it's, and it, it, it sounds, it sounds weird because it, it came out around the time of Khalees's album, uh, yes, Tasty. Tasty. And Andre 3000 has a song on that album with her called Millionaire, which is one of my right. favorite songs. But they are talking about, um, capitalism and you know being a rich bitch and telling the truth to your friends etc all the things that uh rich people celebrities think about all the time you know right uh if i weren't a millionaire would you still love me that kind of vibe and i think that that song is probably more suited to gwen stefani and, and andre yeah if it were yeah, yeah, yeah. and maybe Khalees and andre 3000 could have done a better version of long way to go but i also think that that song really should not exist i love the beat it's the definition of i like the beat but it is one of the most embarrassing pop songs that i've ever had to listen to and still it's like saying you like the bread on a sandwich i mean put anything <laughs> else on it though please please um no it remind. and then the girls will be girls or boys will be boys uh the final song off future nostalgia sort of has a similar like an attempt at saying something that just feels a little stunted and a little not thought out but yeah. um no but uh, otherwise man i really do love love angel music baby and actually the sweet escape too though i can't think of another sophomore album that sounds more like the songs that didn't get into the previous album like literally one at a time the songs are not as good as what's on love angel music baby you coming for yummy yummy is maybe the best thing i love early winter also yeah. Also, Gwen has good balladeer energy. That's something she and Madonna have in common, where they they strike the image of just you know a uh, bubblegum pop star, but actually there's balladeer angst that makes them a little bit deeper than the average person you hear on the radio. Let us not forget fluorescent. 
because a friend of Love mine that. played another song that, that sounds like a Madonna song. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. my a friend played fluorescent at a party. Uh, like my friend who was DJ played fluorescent a few weeks ago, and I was for a second. It took me a second to register that that was that song and off of Sweet Escape because it was such a throwback. And there were people coming up to him asking, "Who is this? Or is this a new Gwen Stefani song?" And we were like, "Sweet Escape, baby." So that yeah. I mean, so much of her first two albums have endured in a beautiful way, and I hope we get just the good ones when she does Coachella. Yeah, I do right, not right, want right. any of that Blake Shelton shit. <laughs> just an unholy union. Did I already bring up recently that she was inaugurated into the Orange County Hall of Fame, which feels like one of the shadiest accolades a person can receive? <laughs> her and Vicky Gunvalson. <laughs> oh no not that kennedy center honors well last thing about lamb that song is also such whiplash for their really fun song that they have on the album bubble pop electric oh yes oh yes right a very silly um song where it's sort of it, it takes it's like a 50s uh yeah make out in our car vibe except yeah. just deliriously naughty Johnny, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, characters. Yes, characters. Yeah. There's a lot of really... This is 2024. And 2004 was a big year for pop music, and especially for us with leaving high school and then going right. into college. So I don't know. I feel like I'm kind of here for every 20th anniversary. Every 20th anniversary this year is going to hit. Like okay, no Ashley Simpson, we speak your name. Autobiography? Come out of hiding. Yeah, right. The Shadow? She, we'll be belting an- that one. I think she announced that she's going to be doing something, tours, or at least a couple shows in New York or L.A. to celebrate uh, Autobiography's 20th anniversary. And I um. recently saw her perform at, well, perform is generous. I saw her get into the booth. With Ty Sutherland, who was playing a couple of her songs, uh, Pieces of Me and um, La La at the Christian Siriano after party during Fashion Week. She hopped up, did not remember the words to La La, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, it's she not was really handed, real she was words that, that are around, going on in that song. Yeah, But Pieces of Me, she knew perfectly. Oh. Unfortunately, she has not hit TikTok. Because someone Gen right. Z turned to me and said, just in the audience, and said, who is this? Unacceptable. And does this mean we're due for a Cara Diaguardi renaissance? My fingers are crossed. Honey, it's well, time. Where are you? I want well, to know where you are. <laughs> well, Katy Perry is leaving Idol. So. Oh, there's a slot open. Oh, please return to back? Idol. <laughs> the yeah. Carasons? A, a war-torn Cara Diaguardi coming back to American Idol. <laughs> Ira, what is your keep it this week? My keep it this week goes to a cinematic train wreck, as I call it. Uh, Mia Culpa, the new Tyler Perry film, which aired on Netflix. And now, you went for this? You went, you went ahead and watched it? Which is a controversial thing to do with a Tyler Perry film these days. Okay, first of all, when a Tyler Perry film hits, it hits, okay? I thought I was going to get acrimony. I thought I was going to get Temptation, Confessions of a Marriage Counselor. Those are two very bad movies, which are very fun to watch, okay? I did not think I was going to get anything of the level of I can do bad all by myself. Because mm-hmm. that one seems to at least have an emotional hook it's a story about taraji p henson as a single mother uh struggling to make it in the music industry but this is in his new vein of uh, lifetime s thrillers okay just with hot people in them this stars kelly Rowland, uh who is absolutely gorgeous Oh, she and is so like, gorgeous. Like, yeah. W- one of our hottest celebrities. Uh, they're, they're routinely in photos with Beyonce. Kelly Rowland is the person who my eyes go to. Take that. I hope yeah. Beyonce takes note. <laughs> Beyonce is hanging out with TikTokers trying to sell that hair, Caroline. Okay. <laughs> uh, if you have 50 followers, you met Beyonce this week. 
<laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> but Kelly is also a very good actress, I feel like. I just wish that she was in something better than this. I would also say the same for Trevante Rhodes, who is also a gorgeous man, was very captivating in Moonlight, is very beautiful to look at in this film. Unfortunately, it's garbage. Mm. And more than garbage, because garbage could be fun, it's boring as hell. Now, that is a word I do not associate with Tyler Perry, so I do not know how that happened. And this gets me to Tyler Perry's recent comments about how AI is going to be awful and ruin the industry. That interview is extremely confusing. It's extremely confusing because he talked about how he had used AI himself. Right. And he's like, oh, I was going to buy $800 million worth of land to expand my studio so I could film all the time. But I'm not going to do that anymore because AI is going to change everything. We have to do everything in our power to stop it, except I also am not paying money to do the thing that would help stop it. Also, it sounds like your films are already being written by AI. Right. <laughs> right. AI is doing a really good job with you, unfortunately. Need I remind you that everything is written, produced by, directed by Tyler Perry, lighting by Tyler Perry, hair by Tyler Perry, bad wigs. Uh, <laughs> Woven by Tyler Perry. <laughs> there, there is no, there, he doesn't have real crews. He doesn't have writers that he likes to pay, lest we forget his whole beef with the WGA from before. So... I don't know. It seems like Tyler Perry worried about AI is noble, I guess. But he's such a fucking lunatic. Right. I'm sorry. You hate AI, but you've used AI. You're making these bad movies. You don't want to pay crews. What are we even doing here? And it's so unfortunate, too, because I know, like, ugh, I know my mom probably loved it. <laughs> well, someone probably <laughs> did. I mean, like, he's going to keep making them, obviously. The yeah. internet told me this week that... When he tries calling Aretha Franklin, Aretha Franklin makes him do the Medea voice on the phone, which is a good way of reminding you who you are when you're talking to Aretha Franklin. <laughs> do your yippy little voice. Okay, She's, that's enough. She, she, Bye said, now. Get, she said, get it right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you won't be zooming her. You won't be zooming her. I have been spinning that song nonstop for the past month, by the way. Get it get right. It right? Oh. Yeah. I'm very obsessed with uh, Aretha Franklin's jump from the original Sparkle soundtrack. Okay. And now we're going to jump. But anyway, this is just peak Tyler Perry sounding the alarm about AI when you admitting that you've used it in two of your films already. <laughs> right. He's very like outside of bounds of the conversation we're trying to have. Yes. Uh, he is. He is who he is, you know? <laughs> pretty good and gone girl i have to say get back to acting baby right and being like seventh build mm -hmm. yeah Th that and he was also one of the only good parts about that netflix movie the one where he was in it with oh Kate don't Blanchett. look up don't look up yes. yes a movie we tried to give a best picture nomination to and then we did and then society got a little worse yeah you know this is the white american fiction yeah there we are ding 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 wow yeah. we really that was really something leonardo dicaprio was passionate about hmm makes you think well he does love the environment right i i assume they sent him a big script that had just uh a piece of masking tape on it and uh, in pen the environment written on it and then he's like oh i'm interested and then he picked it up and read it like remember that whole period where all we used to get from news stories about Leonardo DiCaprio was about how he cared about the planet and about how he was getting solar paneling in yes. his L.A. mansion. No, Honestly, I told you once upon a time I wrote a uh, a prize for Billy on the street, which was a, a signed bag of the environment by Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> Actually, maybe that's why he dates such young women. Right. You he's think it's like he's caring thing. about the future. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> a recycling thing. <laughs> He, no, he believes the children are our future, Lewis. Oh, I see. I see. Teach them yeah. well and let them lead the way. He's he actually and building yeah. a team of planeteers. I see. Talk about somebody who needs a Wendy Williams interview, Leonardo DiCaprio. That is exactly <laughs> what we are missing from the tw 2000s and 2010s. <laughs> All right. Uh, that's our episode this week. Thank you to the amazing deny guerrera i mean somebody who's on a tv show that long also a tony award nominated playwright who 
who has done it like her? Who has? Let me tell you, Tyler Perry. Oh, damn it. Fuck. I need yeah. to think of him. Yeah. She'll, she'll never be him. She'll never be Glamour. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> right, she can we'll do actually time. really well all by herself. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> all right. We'll see you next week. Bye.